Well, welcome to the fifth seminar in honor of uh, Giorgio Parisi. Today we have uh, Slava Richkov. Slava is a renowned theoretical physicist, best known for his uh, studies on conformal field theory and uh, its applications to condensed matter physics and string theory. Um, there are several contributions Slava gave, uh, for example, the determination of critical exponents in a 3D seeing model with the bootstrap, conformal bootstrap. And also uh, his contributions to phenomenology are very well, well known in X physics, especially. Um, Slava is also well known in the community for his um, harsh, direct, and very smart criticism. And uh, I remember my first seminar in Scuola Normale, the warning was, be very careful. There is Riccardo Barbieri in the audience. When I gave my second seminar, the warning was, be very careful. There is Slava Richkov in the audience and is much, much worse. <laughs> so, so we are very happy to have him here and please. Uh, thanks very much, Antonella. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to see so many friends. Uh, since my time as a phenomenologist and since my time as a statistical physicist. And in fact, it's also a very special uh, pleasure and honor because it's in this very room four years ago that I uh, first heard about this problem that I'm going to talk about and this work by Georgia Parisi and Nicolas Verlas. So uh, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's a problem of statistical physics and in statistical physics, we deal with systems uh, with many degrees of freedom, locally interacting. That's the most uh, standard setup, uh, like the easing model. Uh, and about this uh, very simple systems, very simple models, we ask various basic questions and the usual list of questions is like, what is the phase diagram of this model that you are interested in? Uh, what are the phase transitions in this phase diagram and whether these transitions are first order or continuous phase transitions? And if you happen to have a continuous phase transition in your phase diagram, then uh, the problem becomes even more interesting. You can associate uh, to this continuous phase transitions fixed points of randomization group flow. And you can ask what are uh, the features of these fixed points, which usually possess a great degree of universality. Uh, so you can ask if these fixed points have some additional symmetries compared to the microscopic model, some emergent symmetries, often conformal invariances, such an emergent symmetry. Uh, so these are qualitative questions. And you can also ask quantitative questions about what are the critical exponents uh, associated with these fixed points. And all of these questions, they, uh, they will appear today in, in the study of the random field easing model. But first, let me, let me uh, remind that usually in these models of statistical mechanics, they come in two kinds. There are pure models, and there are disordered models. So the pure models, they describe materials which do not have any impurities. So they have, imagine a crystal lattice, which is perfectly periodic. Uh, there are no defects. So there is a translational invariance. Uh, so this is the classic easing model is of this type. But uh, in real materials, they always have some defects. And so to describe uh, uh, such real materials, we consider disordered models. And uh, so we add to the pure model some impurities. And these impurities, uh, often they have uh, the lifetime uh, and the thermization time of impurities is much, much longer than the thermization time of the, uh, of the microscopic degrees of freedom uh, of the pure model. And so it makes sense to consider these impurities as frozen to their, to their state. They are frozen, but they are 
randomly distributed in your material. And so that's the setup which defines a disordered model. And for the easing model, one can consider two types of impurities. One can consider impurities uh, which uh, do not have any magnetic moment. So they just kind of disorder local interactions of the model, like the, the nearest neighbor spins may interact some of them a little bit stronger than others. Uh, so this is the first type of impurities. But today we are interested in, uh, in impurities which have their own randomly oriented magnetic moment. So uh, th this sort of impurities, magnetic impurities, they can be modeled by adding uh, locally uh, magnetic field to the easing model. So this magnetic field can be uniform. So that's not the situation that we are interested in, but we are interested in peppering the easing model with random magnetic fields, somewhere positive, somewhere negative, which is random but frozen. And so that, that is the definition of the random field easing model. So let me, just for this slide, let me be very mathematical. So you, let me give a formal definition of the model. We have a cubic lattice in D dimensions. And on every side of the lattice, we put an easing spin, which can take two values, plus or minus one. And we put a random magnetic field, which is of the form H times GX. So GX are independent standard Gaussian random variables. So standard deviation one. And so you multiply this GX, which is on every side X by an overall factor, which I call H, which determines the strength of this random magnetic field. And so the random field easy model is defined as the Gibbs distribution acting on these easing spins with uh, this random magnetic field, HGX, which couples to every easing spin SX. So it's a, it's a Gibbs distribution, E to the Hamiltonian times of one over temperature. But this is a random Gibbs distribution because you fix the, this random magnetic fields. And so we have uh, a family of these random Gibbs distributions, which depends on two parameters, the temperature and the strength of this random field disorder H. That's the, the definition of the model. So this model, which I define mathematically, it has uh, various uh, experimental realizations. So it can be studied experimentally, but you know, I, if someone is interested, I can come back to this at the end of my talk. So about this model, we ask the questions that I, that I mentioned. So we ask, what is the phase diagram of this model? And just as, a, as the usual easy model, you discover that uh, this model can be in two phases. It can be either a paramagnet or it can be a ferromagnet. So you have this phase diagram. So let me explain what's going on here. So uh, you see that there is this paramagnetic phase, which, okay, if the temperature is large, then we know that the normal using model, usual using model, which lives on this horizontal axis, we know that for very large temperature, the usual using model is a paramagnet. It's, a, it's in a disordered state. There's no average magnetization. And of course, if you add an extra source of disorder, which is the random magnetic field, it becomes even more disordered. So it still stays a paramagnet. But even at low temperature, if you add a very strong random magnetic field, then what happens? It, it happens that at every site, we have a spin. It's going, if, if the random magnetic field is very, very strong, then every spin is just going to point locally in the same direction as the local magnetic field. And so, you know, some spins are going to point up, some spins are going to point down, and there's going to be no average magnetization. So it's going to be again a paramagnet. So this explains the paramagnetic phase. And then the claim is that if the temperature is low, is below critical temperature, we know that the pure easing model here is ferromagnetic. It exhibits an average uh, non-zero magnetization. And so the claim is that 
if you add a sufficiently small disordered uh, random magnetic field, then this ferromagnetic phase is stable, survives for small random magnetic field. So this magnetization, this non-zero magnetization, which is present in the model, it's not destroyed by adding a small random magnetic field. So th this can appear rather natural, uh, but there is a small subtlety. So this phase diagram is true, uh, not in every D, but in D larger than two. So in two dimensions, there is a, uh, there is a small subtlety. There is a, a new effect, which is, was discovered by Imri and Ma. Uh, uh, and in fact, this ferromagnetic phase here doesn't exist in two dimensions. But I'm not going, I don't have time to talk about this and I'm just going to focus on D larger than two in this talk. Okay, the next classic question, what are the phase transitions? What is their nature? So here it is believed that this whole line separating the paramagnet phase to the, from the ferromagnet phase is a second order, is a continuous phase transition which belongs uh, to universality class different from the easing model universality class. So the easing model universality class is associated with this fixed point here, which I denoted by I, which, which is at zero disorder, at zero uh, random magnetic field. And the moment you turn on a very small random magnetic field, this easing fixed point is unstable you trigger a randomization group flow and it flows. So any point on this line separating the two phases, it flows to a new fixed point, RF, which is in a different universality class. It has a different set of critical exponents. And this random field fixed point lives at the zero temperature. So that's that's very uh, that's kind of unusual uh, to someone who, you know, like me, a few years ago didn't know much about this physics of disorder at fixed points. So uh, th th there exist randomization group fixed points even without disorder, which live at zero temperature. But usually these fixed points are very boring, very trivial, very easy to study, very easy to understand, and, and they are not usually they are they do not have any non-trivial critical behavior associated with them. But here uh, we have this fixed point RF, which is at zero temperature, and yet it has very non-trivial critical behavior with critical exponents, uh, with non-trivial critical exponents. So this is a, a curious feature of this model. And so the problem uh, that people got interested in the late 70s is to understand the nature of these fixed points, of this fixed point. So those were the early days of randomization group. So people were exploring this land, uh, this, this large landscape of critical behaviors. Uh, important discoveries were made every day. So there's a heyday of randomization group studies. And <clears throat> uh, the uh, the method that was widely used back then, and it's still considered to be a solid method, is to, to say that if you are interested in, in the critical behavior, so in, in the behavior of a lattice model at long distance scales, you're allowed to replace your uh, lattice model by a field theory. And so, uh, so the, what kind of field theory can you consider? So this is an effective field theory, which is supposed to have exactly the same critical behavior as the microscopic model. So uh, it's very easy to cook up this field theory. You take, uh, for the spin model, we know what we're supposed to do is to replace uh, the spins by a scalar field phi, which is kind of a coarse grained magnetization field. Uh, which has some uh, kinetic term grad phi squared. And uh, this field phi, it's going to have a mass term, which is going to determine whether you, the field 
is in the order to the disordered phase, depending on the sign. And you also should allow for some sort of interactions, quartic term, lambda phi to the fourth. So that, that is the usual uh, Lagrangian, which was considered by Wilson and Fisher in their work on the critical phenomena. And here, you know, we have on top of this, we are supposed to add a random magnetic field. So we just add a linear term H times phi, but H now is a random X dependent magnetic field. So it has uh, average value zero, H has very, uh, and it has a second cumulant. So it has the average value of the product H of X, H of Y. So this over bar denotes the average over the distribution of the magnetic field. It is local. So we assume that it's a local distribution. So there is delta function of X minus Y. And we have some overall constant R, which is the measures the disorder strength. So this is a, a field theory that, that we are supposed to consider. Very simple. And so when people, uh, you know, the first thing that uh, people started doing with this field theory in the 70s is to is perturbation theory. So this theory has uh, a slightly unusual perturbation theory compared to uh, to the usual quartic phi to the fourth. So it has the same vertices as the phi to the fourth theory. It has the quartic vertex, but it also has a linear vertex which couples phi to h. So this vertex, which is in the language of particle physics, is called a tadpole vertex. It tells you that if you start computing diagrams, say for phi, you are going to have uh, diagrams where H appears on external legs linearly. So you have this diagrams where you know you, you take H, you connect it by the propagator to phi. You take H, every H emits a propagator, then there's a quartic vertex, you connect it again to phi. Uh, so these are all three diagrams that I drew here. Uh, but of course, they're going to be diagrams with loops also, which I didn't draw here. So that's for the average value of phi at a given value of H is given by such an expansion. But now suppose that you want to compute a correlation function where you average over all H's. So that's what you're supposed to do because we, we, uh, we have uh, a variety of random H's for every H we compute the correlation function and then we have to average over all H's. And when we average over all H's, we are supposed to use this propagator for H. H of X, H of Y is equal to the delta function. And delta function, if you transform it, if you Fourier transform it to momentum space, it becomes one. And so what this means is that, you know, if you take a product of two such three expansions and, and you have this propagator H of X, H of Y is equal to one, well, it just means that you have to glue these crosses to some other crosses else somewhere. And so you get uh, a very simple uh, expansion for this, for example, this average value f of x, phi of x, phi of y averaged, where you will get some lines which contain crosses on them. So it means that you have a propagator here, one over p squared, you have a propagator here, one over p squared, and then you glued these two propagators by the propagator for h. And so you, in the line with cross, you get an effective propagator, which is one over p to the fourth. So it's, a little bit of an unusual perturbation theory, but it's very manageable. And so when you know, people understood this perturbation theory, they made uh, a number of interesting observations. So the first observation is that these propagators uh, with crosses, as I said, it's a product of two propagators, one over P squared, so it becomes R over P to the fourth. So when you do a Feynman integral with such a propagator, one over p to the fourth, uh, this integral becomes more divergent, more singular at low p. Because you, you, it becomes more infrared divergent. 
And so this has a very important consequence. You find that uh, in, in the usual uh, phi to the fourth field theory, you had logarithmic behavior of loop integrals in four dimensions. And so this was very important because this implied that the uh, upper critical dimension of the easing model is equal to four. And in this theory, since some of the propagators became one over p to the fourth, you find that the logarithmic behavior is in six dimensions, not in, in four dimensions. And so the upper critical dimension of this model is six, not four. That's the first observation. The second observation is that, okay, uh, I, I drew this uh, diagrams and I didn't draw any diagrams with loops with loops without crosses, with loops without crosses. And the reason why I didn't draw them is that because those diagrams with loops without crosses, they are uh, less singular in the infrared than the diagrams where some of the propagators have crosses. And so what people said uh, in the early in the 70s is that they said okay look uh, these diagrams since they are not infrared singular order by order in perturbation theory let's just drop those diagrams i mean they they are interested in in uh, in computing the critical behavior of the model they are interested in behavior at long distances so it looks like those diagrams are are, are less important than other diagrams so let's just drop them Okay, that seemed like a very reasonable uh, thing to do, especially in the early days when you're just exploring uh, the model for the first time. And once they do it, they were left with a much smaller class of Feynman diagrams. And they noticed, first by like just by computing a few of these diagrams, uh, they noticed, look, uh, it's very weird. All of these Feynman diagrams that we are computing, they come out to be exactly equal to the Feynman diagrams of the usual phi to the fourth theory, but in D minus two dimensions. So first they just noticed this by explicit computations and then uh, they proved it. So Aharoni, Imri and Ma, they proved it mathematically that in perturbation theory, you can just prove a theorem that the value of the Feynman diagram uh, with crosses is equal to the value of some other Feynman diagram without crosses in D minus two dimensions. And so, well, if you believe this theorem and if you believe perturbation theory, they uh, uh, were led to this conclusion that the critical exponents of the random field easing in six minus epsilon dimensions have to be exactly the same as the values of the critical exponents of the usual easing model in four minus epsilon dimensions. And so this was called dimensional reduction. And okay, at this point, Georgia comes into the game. So this was uh, clearly a very uh, surprising observation. So why uh, why should uh, why should the Feynman diagrams of one theory in uh, in d dimensions be equal to Feynman diagrams of another theory in d minus two dimensions? Nobody has seen anything like that before that. So this clearly uh, had to have some deeper explanation. And so uh, in this paper uh, of George and Nicolas Rolas in 1971 79 they uh, explained this coincidence. So let me uh, go through the line of uh, reasoning of this paper. So there are several, there are several uh, ingredients in this argument. Uh, everything starts with the following basic observation. So let us let us not question this assumption that uh, the diagrams without loops are the most important diagrams. Let's not try to question this assumption for the moment. So we have these three diagrams that we have to focus on. And a very basic observation is that if you are just looking at 
the uh, tree diagrams, it means that you're not doing quantum theory, but you're actually doing classical theory. And in classical theory, you are just solving a partial differential equation. So you're not doing a path integral. You are doing something much more simple. You are just solving a partial differential equation. A classical partial differential equation, which is right, right here. So H acts as a source. You have, this is the equation of motion. This is a classical equation of motion. <laughs> Box phi plus V prime of phi equals H. So if you, if you solve this equation in perturbation theory order by order, you reproduce this tree expansion. So everything starts from here, but then uh, there are some other key ingredients. And the first of these ingredients is a, is a smart, I would call it a smart manipulation of path integrals. So right now we are, of course, very familiar in uh, with path integrals. Uh, I'm not sure in the 70s people, everyone was as familiar uh, with uh, path integrals and as as brave at using path integrals as we are now. So probably what George and Nicola did back then seemed uh, uh, very brave. So what they did is the following. They said, okay, we, we want to compute this uh, average value phi h phi h. So we have to do a path integral over h with some weight which reproduces the, the propagator h h equals delta function. And under the, we also have to compute, you know, some integral over phi. What kind of integral? Well, it's an integral in which we insert a delta function which says that we are supposed to, we are interested in phi's which are solving this partial differential equation. But, but that's not everything. So, uh, because you know, if we just had this delta function, then uh, when you do the integral over the delta function, you are supposed to, uh, to include uh, a, a determinant factor which arises when you consider fluctuations around the solution of this of this uh, equation and so they didn't want this determinant factor because they just wanted to to look at the classical solution and just count it with factor one and so in order to get rid of this delta function it is determinant they just multiplied this delta function by the determinant by the functional determinant Then they said, okay, this determinant is not, uh, is, is a non-local object, hard to deal with. Let me just represent this, this determinant as a functional integral over some auxiliary uh, anti-commuting scalar fields, psi and psi bar. And so this, uh, this construction is, uh, uh, familiar nowadays to particle physicists because it's exactly the same construction that we use in the fadeev popov integral. So these are anti-commuting uh, scalar fields. And so this means, since we are introducing this anti-commuting fermion, uh, fermionic scalar fields, it means that the theory that we are dealing with is non-unitary. So in particle physics, when we do the fadeev popov trick, and uh, uh, in the young Mills theory introduced the Fadeev Popov ghosts, there uh, the theory is unitary. I mean, it, it, is, uh, it succeeds to remain unitary because the unitarity is broken twice. It's broken by the spin statistics for ghosts, and it's also broken by the negative norm states of the, of the vector field, of the, of the gluon field. Uh, but here, there is actually no uh, no such resolution. So the theory really is not unitary. Uh, so we have a, a fermionic field which violates uh, spin statistics theorem, but we shouldn't be surprised, uh, you know, if uh, particle physicists in the audience, they shouldn't be uh, too scandalized by this because uh, here we are doing statistical physics 
so in statistical physics unitarity is not uh, is not a must because unitarity is a must if you are interested in weak rotating your theory to minkowski space and recovering unitary theory there but here we are not going to weak rotate our theory to minkowski space it's just the theory is going to leave only euclidean space so we are allowed to consider such non-unitary theories <clears throat> okay and so uh after these formal manipulations with path integrals they represented uh, the correlation function phi phi as a path integral over over four fields so phi which is the original field psi and psi bar which are these uh, ghost fermionic ghost fields and okay there is also some auxiliary field omega which is just needed to rewrite a square of something in a in a linear form uh, and so this action which depends on four fields is this famous parisi surlas action it has the following form so minus r omega squared over two then there is this linear term coupling omega to the uh, classical equation of motion of phi and there is this term psi psi bar which reproduces the determinant So that's the end of part two. And then the part three is that uh, they noticed, and here I don't really know the, the, the story of how it went. Maybe Georgia will tell us later on. So they noticed that this action, it's not so obvious to, it's not so obvious to notice this. So they noticed that this action has a supersymmetry. Now, uh, supersymmetry, it was already at the time a famous symmetry in particle physics, both at, uh, at the formal level, it was already introduced, I think, in particle physics in uh, early 70s. And even uh, in mid 70s, the supersymmetry was uh, in particle physics, it was noticed uh, I think by Pierre Fayet that um, supersymmetry helped to solve the hierarchy problem of the standard model. So it was a, a popular symmetry. But the supersymmetry that we have here is not of the same kind as in particle physics. Because in particle physics, since we are interested in particle physics in unitary theories, fermions are spinners not scalars, and supercharges are also spinners. So here we have a supersymmetry, but the supercharges uh, uh, which rotate fermionic fields into bosonic fields, they are scalars, not spinners. So in a certain sense, it's a much simpler supersymmetry, a much simpler thing to explain. And the way you can explain this is that you, you, you construct something which is called a superfield, so it's an object which depends on not just on x but on two extra super space components theta and theta bar so you you package the four fields phi psi bar psi and omega in one object uh, which you call big phi and then you write uh, a super space integral so an integral over dx d theta bar and d theta and under the integral you write objects you write functions of the super field which are all covariant which are all super space covariant for example instead of using the usual laplacian you use super laplacian which is a particular linear combination of the usual laplacian and d theta bar d theta and so if you can write your action so first the first thing you check is that if you do this uh, superspace integral you just land on the parisi surlas action so that's just an exercise that you can do and the second thing is that you are guaranteed that if the action of the theory can be written as a superspace integral where everything is covariant then it's guaranteed that your theory is going to be symmetric under rotations of your superspace in the same way that if you can write your action in a way which is manifestly Lorentz invariant, where all up indices are contracted with all down indices. And this guaranteed that your theory is going to be rotationally invariant. So in exactly the same way, 
here you, you are guaranteed that the theory is going to be supersymmetric. And the final observation of Giorgio Nicola was to notice that supersymmetry naturally implies dimensional reduction. So you don't have to, uh, to prove this. Uh, um, uh, so the, the original proof of uh, the fact that supersymmetry plus dimensional reduction by Aharoni, Imre, and Ma, it, it, it was relying on some analysis of Feynman diagrams, which looks a little bit ad hoc. Well, here it just comes out naturally on the nose. So what you say is that, okay, if my theory is supersymmetric, then I don't have to do uh, perturbation theory in terms of Feynman diagrams. I can do it in terms of super Feynman diagrams, where instead of propagators, I use super propagators. So super propagators, they depend in position space, uh, not on X, but they are, depend on X theta theta bar in a particular linear combination, which has to be uh, invariant. So X squared plus theta theta bar. And so uh, uh, when you have any Feynman diagrams, you, you have a certain number of external vertices, you have some internal vertices, you have to do integrals over these internal dimensions. And uh, what they observed is that when you do this integrals over the internal dimensions, internal co coordinates, you have to do the integral over xi, theta, I, and theta bar i. And then they noticed that whenever you do integral over theta and theta bar, this kills minus two internal uh, components of X. So the, the two fermionic directions are equivalent to minus two bosonic directions. And so this just, uh, uh, I mean, this just proved dimensional reduction on the nose. So, uh, You, you can also view it like this, this property of dimensional reduction. You have, uh, you have a theory which lives in the superspace, which has D bosonic directions and two fermionic directions. In this superspace, we pick, we pick a, a plane, a D minus two, two dimensional plane, where we set uh, fermionic directions to zero and two out of D bosonic directions to zero. So we consider such a plane. And so then the claim is that if you consider the correlation function of the original theory, of the original supersymmetric theory, so the correlation function can have points moving everywhere in this superspace. But now let us consider the correlation function where we put all points in this plane, in this D minus two dimensional plane. The claim is that, that such a correlation function restricted to this D minus two dimensional plane is equal to the correlation function of the D minus two dimensional theory computed from the D minus two dimensional Lagrangian, phi to the fourth Lagrangian. So that's, uh, uh, that's the claim. And this claim, this claim is actually solid. So it stood, the test of time. So uh, Parisian Surlas proved it in perturbation theory in 79. But since then, many other proofs have been given, perturbative and non-perturbative, uh, that, uh, um, that this holds. And in fact, uh, so I don't know if there are any string theorists in the audience. Uh, so in, in uh, Supersymmetric field theory, there's such a phenomenon which is called supersymmetric localization, where you can, uh, so you're supposed to do uh, a path integral over, or an ordinary integral over a big space. And then, uh, and then it turns out that uh, you, don't, you don't have to do this integral over big space, but in fact, it localizes to some much smaller subspace of fields. And it turns out, okay, one of the proofs which has been given for this phenomenon is precisely such supersymmetric localization proof. Mm. Uh, 
we consider this problem from some abstract conformal field theory point of view and also it also worked perfectly well so basically this part of the story is uh, has hardly any doubt okay i'm going to come back uh, to discuss the status of this uh, dimension reduction in the random field easing model in a second but first i would like to discuss uh, a, a, a cousin problem, which is a problem of branched polymers. So this uh, this is a problem which is at first sight completely different. I mean, it has nothing to do with the, with the random field easy model. So it, it's it's not a problem of lattice statistical mechanics. It's a problem of polymers. So you can so polymers are, are chains made of uh, of links which can orient, you know, with respect to each other. And on top of links, you also allow these chains to be joined uh, to branch at certain points. So this is called a branched polymer. And you just consider all possible configurations for these systems uh, to branch and to bend. With the only constraint is that they shouldn't come close to each other. So there is a certain repulsive potential. And uh, there are real molecules which behave like that. Uh, and you are interested in how the average size of such a random molecule depends on the number of links. And it grows as a certain power of the number of links. And this power is a critical exponent. So it's a universal critical exponent, which you can, for example, measure in a, in a lattice simulation or in an experiment. <clears throat> and uh, so it turns out that people were interested in this problem again in the late 70s. And uh, there is a, a paper by Lubensky and Isakson who constructed a field theory for this branched polymer. So this is a little bit uh, unusual, but uh, it's been known since the work of the gen that you can study the physics of polymers by considering field theories and then taking uh, various weird limits of these field theories for example taking the number of components of the field going to zero or something like that and so this was a sort of uh, theory that Lubensky and Isakson considered in 78 and uh, Georgia and Nicola in 81 so two years after the first paper they observed that this theory of Lubensky and Isakson, it is formally equivalent to the theory of the random field easing model, provided that you replace phi to the fourth potential by phi cube potential. Now, phi cube potential is, is not a very good potential. Uh, because it's not stable, but here you are considering imaginary coupling. So it's oscillating, but the problem of stability doesn't pose itself. <clears throat> and in fact, there is a famous model of statistical mechanics uh, with this i phi cube potential. It's called Li Yang singularity theory. Uh, it's exactly solvable in uh, two dimensions. So it's uh, if where it's a conform minimal model conformal field theory so it's a very well known theory and so by using this supersymmetric arguments uh, Paris and Surlas argued that uh, the critical exponents for branched polymers uh, in d dimensions have to be equal to the critical exponents of this Li Yang singularity theory in d minus two dimensions by exactly the same arguments as for the random field is one and it turns out that this prediction is in perfect agreement with everything we know. With numerical simulations, it's like it's it's very easy to uh, simulate this uh, branched polymers uh, on the lattice. Uh, it's uh, the critical exponents of the Liang singularity are, are very well known uh, from randomization group, from conformal field theory, from whatnot. Uh, so everything just perfectly agrees. Uh, so, 
there is even some uh, rigorous work which you know tries to explain uh, that why this agrees but you know I, I think this work doesn't really explain why it works in a generic model it only explains it for some fine-tuned models but whatever <clears throat> so now let us go to the random field easing model for the random field easing model the situation is not so easy uh, so first of all when people propose this dimensional reduction they noticed right away that this cannot always be true because it doesn't work in the most interesting physical case the three-dimensional case if you take a random field easing model in three dimensions it has a phase transition it has non-trivial critical exponents uh, but if you believe the dimensional reduction you would conclude that the one-dimensional easy model should have a phase transition but but it doesn't so clearly something doesn't work so people were not stupid they noticed this right away and they said oh well this doesn't work because you know it's three dimensions and you're expanding around six dimensions so somewhere in the middle perturbation theory is going to break down it's a perturbative argument so okay things will get clear in a few years but uh but what was precisely the reason why this happens like for example okay in 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 the random field easing model it it breaks down but if you look at the usual easing model where you go from four dimensions to two dimensions and nothing breaks down so th there has to be a reason for things to break down and so uh, the, this reason it became a puzzle to explain this reason and then uh, the, the the question also was okay does it break down uh, somewhere in the middle between six dimensions and three dimensions or perhaps it just doesn't work even near six dimensions because we just just got something completely wrong and perturbation theory cannot be trusted and these arguments they went on and on for many many years uh, until uh, some new key element was injected into the story namely some very high quality numerical simulations so this is uh, uh, this were performed in uh, 2010 uh, 2013 2017 by uh, by the group which uh, included fitas martin meyer pico and surlas who measured uh, the critical exponents of the random field easy model with very good accuracy in three, four, and five dimensions. Now, there is a reason why they were able to perform this numerical simulations. It's uh, actually an interesting reason because in some disordered models, numerical simulations are extremely difficult to perform, uh, but actually this random field easy model is a lucky case. So there are very, uh, there are very efficient algorithms which allow you to do this. Fortunately, I don't have time to talk about them. And so what did they find? Well, they, they found that, for example, if you do things in four dimensions, you find some critical exponents of the random field easy model, you find some numbers, and they have nothing to do with the exact solution of the two-dimensional easing model. So in from four to two, definitely, dimensional reduction doesn't work but then they did things in five dimensions they noticed that oh wait a second it looks like the new exponent in five dimensions it looks very similar to the very precisely known new exponent in uh, in three dimensions and so it looks like the it looks like the critical exponents agree and it, it actually looks like uh, you know some critical exponents are equal to each other which is a sign of supersymmetry and then there was this very interesting paper in which also georgia i'm sure contributed the key insight uh, where they repeated this five-dimensional simulation in a setup where they were able to extract direct evidence 
for supersymmetry. So supersymmetry implies uh, relations between certain correlation functions, word identities, and they were able to see that this word identities actually hold in five dimensions. And so with this insight, the puzzle uh, was sharpened. So we have uh, supersymmetry, which is operational and implies dimensional reduction for the branched polymers in any D. And if you go to the random field easy model, supersymmetry seems to be operational in 5D, but not in lower D. And so the question is why? <clears throat> and uh, um, a possible scenario that I, I would like to discuss here uh, in conclusion is that, uh, you know, a possible explanation for this puzzle could be the following. So it is important to realize that supersymmetry is not a microscopic symmetry of these models that we are considering. So it's an emergent, it's at best an emergent symmetry, but it's not present at the microscopic level. If you look at the, at the easing model, random field easing model, there is no sign of supersymmetry there. If you look at the branched polymers, uh, again, there is no sign of supersymmetry unless you consider some very particular fine-tuned model, which was considered by Bridges and Imber, there is no sign of supersymmetry. So what you have to explain is how supersymmetry emerges or not emerges when you flow, uh, uh, when you do RG flow to, to, to long distances. And we know the condition for some symmetry to emerge. The symmetry may emerge if the interactions which break the symmetry are irrelevant in the randomization group sense. So then, they, then their coefficients are going to flow to zero and the symmetry has a chance to emerge. So uh, when we, uh, when I describe to you the derivations, the derivation of the paris surlas supersymmetric Lagrangian from the random field easy model, in that derivation, uh, we dropped some terms. When uh, Isaacson and Lubensky derived uh, the model of branched polymers, they also dropped some terms. So the terms that we dropped, uh, you can argue that they are irrelevant in six minus epsilon dimensions, but you don't know what they do in lower D. So you have to do a computation and see if perhaps some terms which were irrelevant close to six dimensions, if they remain, irrelevant in lower D or perhaps some of them are going to become relevant. So this is a, a question of computation. And now you can say, okay, but, but is there any example uh, that terms which are irrelevant, they suddenly become relevant? And, and it turns out that such examples are, there are many such examples and the, you know, the, 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 the famous, there's a very famous example in, uh, in the physics of ferromagnets, uh, where you have a, a three component uh, ferromagnet. Well, if you assume that uh, there's a full rotational invariance, then this is a, called the Heisenberg model. But uh, more generally, you can assume that, that uh, the, that the three components, that there is no full rotational invariance, but there is just an invariance which permutes the three directions and perhaps flips uh, and flips each one of them. This is called the cubic symmetry. And actually in, in any uh, typical ferromagnet, this cubic symmetry is probably going to be uh, the right microscopic symmetry because the lattice, if the lattice has a cubic symmetry, then there's going to be some spin orbit coupling of spins to the lattice, which is going to break rotational invariance to the cubic symmetry. And so it turns out that in this model, the, uh, the interaction which breaks rotational invariance to the cubic symmetry is irrelevant in four minus epsilon dimensions. But as you lower D, 
eventually it becomes relevant. And actually the value of D where it becomes relevant, it's insanely close to D equal three, it's 3.01. But it's like, it's been established by very uh, careful uh, studies that this does happen. So strictly speaking in three dimensions, there are no Heisenberg magnets because this interaction is, is relevant. But okay, in practice, we don't really care about this because this DC is so close to three. But just to show that this phenomenon can actually happen and does happen in some models. And so, in fact, if you go back to the random field easing model, the, uh, indeed, uh, the, uh, this possibility, the, uh, it, it was known to early researchers. And uh, I found uh, in some lectures that Georgia gave in 1982, he already mentions this possibility. He mentions that uh, a careful analysis is needed uh, to find out if uh, the diagrams which were dropped become relevant in some lower D. And so we do need this, this uh, careful analysis. <clears throat> and there were uh, some attempts uh, at performing this uh, careful analysis. There is a, some interesting work by Brizan and Dominicis, and there is some work by Feldman, uh, which uh, identified some effects. They identified some operators which, mm, uh, which can become relevant, but uh, for, uh, for some reason, they uh, went a little bit astray and even though they had good ideas and some of uh, the ideas I think are, are totally correct, but they concluded mm, that the supersymmetry should be lost for arbitrary close D to six. So they, they concluded that even in six minus epsilon supersymmetry is lost. Now, uh, well, this was before, this was before the careful simulations in five dimensions were performed, we show the supersymmetric shape is not lost uh, arbitrary close to D equals six. And so what's going on? <clears throat> well, uh, here, uh, uh, I, in the remaining time, I would like to describe to you some work that uh, I did with upper team coverage in Emilio Trevisani, where we systematically studied the supersymmetry breaking effects using uh, a slightly different formalism. So we, we still used perturbation theory, but not in, uh, in this language that uh, I described uh, before, but in the language using the replica formalism. So as you know, uh, when we study the disordered model, uh, one way to study the disordered model is to consider the replicated Lagrangian where the first term cons consists of N replicas and the second term which couples these replicas together and uh, provided that you take N going to zero limit in this Lagrangian, you recover the original disordered model. So this is well known. <clears throat> and uh, on top of this uh, Lagrangian, you have to make two additional observations. The first observation is that you are, okay, this Lagrangian contains some interactions, all of which, all, all of which preserve the SN symmetry, which permute the N replicas. But when you do randomization group flow, all terms that are permitted by the symmetry are going to be generated. And so you are, if you want to make an exhaustive study of our stability of this model, you are not supposed to just limit yourself to these terms, but you have to be prepared to consider all possible interactions which respect SN invariants. So that's the first observation, which goes back to Brizan de Dominicis. And the second observation is that if you take this Lagrangian and if you compute the propagator out of this uh, kinetic term and this term which mixes the replicas, you find something strange. Well, it's not strange. It's well known that the propagator you find has this form. It has one over P squared term 
and one over p to the to the fourth term. Anyway, people were working with this propagator uh, for many many years, but to to a field theorist, uh, this form of the propagator uh, cries out that uh, the multiplet of fields phi i that you are working with it mixes fields with different scaling dimensions. So when you do randomization group studies, when you do field theory, it's very important to have a basis of fields where every field has a well-defined scaling dimension. Well, here, obviously it's not because if the fields phi i all had the same scaling dimension, then their propagator would scale as a single power of p. Well, here you see two powers of p, one over p squared, one over p to the fourth. And so, uh, uh, okay, this let me skip. So there is, a, there is a smart way to deal with this problem, which was introduced by John Cardi back in, in 85, which amounts to performing a certain linear transformation on this fields phi i. So you pass to the fields phi i to some fields which Cardi called phi omega and chi i. And when you do this transformation, you, you find a Lagrangian which is basically identical to the Parisi Surlas Lagrangian up to the fact that, okay, in Parisi Surlas Lagrangian, you have psi and psi bar, while here you have this field chi i. But the fields chi i are bosonic fields, and there are minus two of them. And so if you, know, you replace this field minus two, bosons by two fermions, as I already mentioned, you can do this, you land directly on the Parisi surlas Lagrangian. And so basically this formalism that, uh, that is based on Cardi fields, it's in my opinion, it's the best formalism for dealing with this problem because all fields have well-defined scaling dimensions. So that's the dream of a of organization group theorist. Uh, the action, uh, the leading action before you add any weird interaction, it's precisely, uh, uh, it's equivalent to the Parisi Surlas action. And you can rather easy compute the anomalous dimensions of any interactions you are interested in, and you can study whether these interactions are uh, becoming relevant or irrelevant. And so in, in this theory, uh, what we found is that indeed there are two interactions. Uh, you know, if you compute their anomalous dimension, you find a negative uh, term in their uh, in their scaling dimension, which makes it so that these interactions, even though they start very irrelevant in in six D, as you interpolate to lower D, they become relevant somewhere between four and five. So in fact, we considered not just these two interactions, we considered many more interactions. There is a reason why these interactions are, you know, the most important ones. It, it, uh, it is, could be explained by classification of various interactions into symmetry types. Unfortunately, I don't have time for that because my time is almost up. <clears throat> and so uh, I think uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it would be very interesting to test this scenario. So there is, uh, in my opinion, uh, this story uh, is, uh, uh, it's a very nice story, but it's lacking one, uh, smoking gun proof. And this proof could be obtained uh, by numerical simulations. So let, let me describe what could be done. Uh, so the, the, the thing is the, poll, is the following. Uh, we are basically saying that there are these two interactions in the theory, which become relevant. And because they become relevant, the randomization group flow, which could lead to a supersymmetric fixed point, instead it leads you somewhere else and it breaks dimensional reduction. But we know that relevant interactions can be tuned, tuned away. And so if this scenario 
to to get like to completely close the story and uh, to get uh, a proof of this scenario what you have to do is that you have to perform a numerical simulation of the random field easy model uh, and try to tune away try to tune away these directions try to change the microscopic model by playing with some extra parameters which uh, which you have at your disposal and uh, if the scenario is true then you should be able to find by tuning uh, a supersymmetric fixed point even in four dimensions so you should you should be able to find even in four dimensional uh, random field easy model the same critical exponents as the exactly known critical exponents of the two dimensional pure easy model and so uh, as far as i know the there are people including georgia himself uh, uh, who are doing some ongoing work uh, uh, which may uh, shed light on this scenario okay i don't know yet if uh, if they find support for for the scenario that i described and then uh, then uh, this is going to uh, be resolved or perhaps they will find again some surprise and then uh, the saga of the random field easing model uh, will have to continue. So whatever happens is going to be very interesting. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you. So thank you very much for the very clear and interesting seminar. So time for question or comments or observation. Well, thank you very much for the very nice seminar. It's at that moment you were asking something at the beginning and was how to go to a question two to a question three. Maybe if you put the slide, one of the first slides. Uh, okay, point two or next, uh, maybe no, next, next. Uh, when we start to do the derivation of supersymmetry. Ah, derivation of supersymmetry. Yes, yeah, yes, he, yes. He, here. Yeah, here, how you how did you discover, uh, how did you get this insight? Yes, yes that exactly. there was I mean, they think so. Well, indeed, we never did that. We started for the supersymmetry. We first wrote the supersymmetry. We first wrote the supersymmetric action. So we wrote uh, SPS. Okay. And after, don't ask me why we wrote SPS. And, uh, it, and uh, after after the wrote SPS, we wrote them in terms of field. Uh, wrote in terms of field, we get the previous formula, the one that is uh, underground. And after doing the integral, we got that this was a supersymmetric random field model. So the supersymmetric random field model was at the end, not at the beginning. Amazing. So, I mean, in this way, it was easy. It was a simple derivation of... <laughs> so, I moved, you moved backwards. And, and this way, you were guaranteed to find something, right? <laughs> and I think that the reason... Maybe, look, next slide. I think that we started from, from the idea that we should write a theory that was contains was a function x t and theta bar. And we're thinking that in this theory, we should have a dimensional reduction, but when we, but we were not having supersymmetric theory in mind. When we, a random field, we started from this idea. We wrote the supersymmetric uh, theory. After we expanded the, the terms in superfield, we got the action. And we realize that integral of a or h and so on one gets the random uh, the 
stochastic differential equation okay. in random field, which we knew that was uh, mm. uh, random easy model. So it was done in the opposite direction, but always you normally one does in this this direction, which is the which is natural to derive, but the opposite of which we did. So yeah. we did on the other way around. Yeah. Okay. It's nice. So other questions, observations. Okay. Okay, now that we know that Giorgio started from the other way around, if one could start uh, studying the problem uh, of the random POTS model instead of the random easy model, do you think that this approach could be still applied and find something interesting or is it limited to the easy model? Mm. So, uh, I think dimensional reduction is, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's completely general. So it should, it's uh, any, any field theory which has a paresis for last supersymmetry in D dimensions, it reduces to local field theory in D minus two dimensions. Uh, so that part stays. What I don't know is uh, what is the status of Parisi Sorla supersymmetry for the random field POTS model. Yeah, I, I never looked at this. Um, do, do you know? No. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I think the ra random field pots model is a complicated case for uh, for the randomization group study because their behavior of the theory close to upper critical dimension is complicated doesn't connect e easily to the, uh, doesn't connect continuously to, uh, to the physical dimensions. Uh, so for the OAN model, there, there exists a discussion of this for the OAN model, for the random, for the random field OAN model. Yeah, so that, uh, that is the case. And, and there as well, uh, supersymmetry, the status of supersymmetry is uh, in dimensional reduction is uh, subtle. Um, so I forgot to mention that indeed uh, uh, these calculations of scaling dimensions uh, that led to two interactions for the random field easy model, which become relevant if you. So for the POTS model is complicated, but applying this to uh, to the branched polymers is very straightforward. So this has been done by by Kaviraj and Trevisani, and they found that these interactions that will become relevant for random field easing for i phi cube, the sign of anomalous dimension changes, and so they they remain irrelevant, and they didn't find any other interaction which has a tendency to become relevant. So in this sense, the theory is consistent. So one last question. Uh, I have a comment uh, and uh, a question. The comment is that uh, this idea of supersymmetry as a way to cancel determinants is also very fruitful in the case of uh, Anderson localization where the nonlinear sigma model has been used as a field theory. Yeah. And in that case, uh, I think Kostya Yefetov has used this idea to uh, implement this nonlinear sigma model without using the replica trick, which was quite also useful as a benchmark in a moment where I think uh, 
crafts of a learner were proposing that operators with more than two derivatives, uh, special derivatives of the field were uh, strongly relevant and posed questions of inconsistencies of this nonlinear sigma model. And um, I think that the problem was eventually solved by Brezen and Nikani, but I don't remember exactly uh, what the, the things were, but this um, supersymmetric formulation of uh, Yefetov was probably useful. And uh, although I don't know about uh, the occurrence of uh, dimensional uh, reduction in that case. So do you know anything in that context also? And then the question is, uh, is another one that um, also in some stochastic uh, processes for field theory formulation, it has been proposed that uh, a supersymmetry encodes in some sense uh, on Zucker uh, principle of time reversibility. Do you know any, can you comment also on, on this? Yeah, thank, thanks for bringing this up. In fact, um, I totally agree uh, about Yefetov. Yeah, this is uh, another famous case of occurrence of supersymmetry in, in statistical physics. I am not sure which one was first. I, I think I think Yefetov was much later, uh, but that's not the point. Uh, I'm. Um, I'm especially curious about your last uh, question myself. So in fact, uh, indeed, uh, there is a famous problem, uh, which is the problem of critical dynamics. So you, 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 you solve critical statics, for example, for easing in D dimensions. Now you want to solve critical dynamics, you add time and some relaxation mechanism, you want to solve critical dynamics. So the standard procedure to solving critical dynamics, which is in the textbooks, says forget about statics and just start from scratch everything. You have to redo RG, epsilon expansion, in presence of uh, dynamics, all critical exponents just have to compute them a lot of extra work, then you compute something. Now, uh, this, uh, to me, it has been always uh, a puzzle. Why can't you somehow use the knowledge? Suppose that you already solved critical static exactly. Suppose that D is equal to two. We know the exact solution of the critical statics, the two dimensional easy model. Can't we somehow feed it in the exact solution of statics to the problem of dynamics. So in my opinion, this is a, an unsolved, uh, as far as I know, this is an unsolved problem. And if this problem is to be attacked, it is very important, a very important consistency condition that you're allowed to use is that the problem of critical dynamics, as you mentioned, it has supersymmetry. Which so the the fact that fluctuation dissipation theorem, it uh, it translates into a form of supersymmetry in the problem of of critical dynamics. I think it's solid. So it's uh, it's really there. And so uh, the if you wish in the problem of critical dynamics, there is a reduction from d plus one to d. So you have critical dynamics in d in d plus one dimensions, which is supersymmetric. And it reduces to a critical dynamics in critical statics in D dimensions, which is pure. So, uh, but how to use it? You know, for the Parisi Surlas story, uh, the relation is from D plus two to D. It's enriched because there is also super conformal invariance. And so it, it's very easy to use, it's very powerful. Here in critical dynamics to critical statics, there is a reduction, there is supersymmetry but it doesn't seem to be as powerful and so it's still an open problem to how to use it efficiently if you have dissipation you could have a dynamical critical index which is even larger than one yeah, yeah. so you have d plus z and then you yeah, may yeah. ask whether d plus z can be uh, reduced dimensionality to d or d plus one or d plus two depending on what z is you see what 
well, that, that's kind of the next level of speculation. I don't know. No, I was thinking, okay, D plus one to D, but the, of course the exponent Z is very important. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank again very much uh, Slava Ritko.